glad to be here. And um, the theme, as you know, I'm just going to go back, is puzzles. And I'm going to talk a lot about puzzles and how they have contributed, the various puzzle pieces, to where I am today. And hopefully in the things that I talk about, it'll help you to also see how puzzles and the puzzle pieces of your life can contribute to where you can go in the future. So first, I'd like to just really give honor to my family. You know, I'm standing here by myself, but I'm definitely not by myself. I have a very supportive family who've helped me to get where I am today. They supported me through school. They support, support me now in my profession. And so I just want to point them out because they're very special to me. At the bottom, you see my parents, Robert and Cynthia Woods. They live in Person County. That's where I was raised. Um, to your left, there's me with my husband who has really supported me through all the years of getting my doctorate degree and then going back for a degree in nursing and now in my field on the tenure track at UNC Chapel Hill. At the very top of, above the tree, that's a baby picture of me with my older sister who's three and a half years older than me. And then beside the, the two girls with the dresses are my daughters. So I have two daughters, age four and eight, and they are my inspiration for all that I do. And so I put the tree with the roots in the middle because there's so many people who aren't on that picture who have contributed to you know, my success right now and where I am. And the roots indicate people like that, like family members, my grandparents, but also teachers and mentors. And since I'm here at NCSSM, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors and teachers here. And one of the ones that I really wanted to recognize, I walked around Wednesday, we had to do a, a tech check Wednesday. And so I walked around and I noticed that on one of the doors, one of my, my uh, Brit Lit professor still works here, and that's John Whitmansey. So if anybody has Mr. Whitmansey, please tell him that I said hello and thank you. Um, because a lot of what has contributed to my science is my uh, education in literature, history, social sciences, and even foreign language. And you may see a little bit about that as we go ahead. And also, one last person I'd like to mention is someone in the audience, and that's Lamia, who was the leader of the dance team when I was here at NCSSM. So I was so happy to see her. So what is a puzzle? One of the definitions that I came across included this. A puzzle is a toy, a problem, or other thing or object designated to amuse, which is, I thought was interesting. A puzzle is designated to amuse by difficulties, difficulties to be solved, a contrivance made purposefully perplexing to promote ingenuity. So as we think about puzzles, we can think about what's the end point. It's designed to promote ingenuity and perhaps to make us our best selves. So I mentioned I was here 20 years ago. That's me as a junior in 1990. I was here 92, 93 is my first year. And the theme for my talk is take the time. And that's actually the front cover of my senior yearbook. And that was the theme of my senior yearbook, take the time. And you'll see throughout my talk what I mean by that. The purpose of Take the Time for the Yearbook was we're so busy as high school students in our organizations and athletics with our um, pursuits for science and math and working towards our college applications and our futures. But how do we take the time to remember what is most important, our health, our families, our friends? What do we do for downtime? How do we make sure we incorporate that so that we are continuously nourished and nurtured so that we don't burn out down the road. Because everyone in here is highly motivated, especially the students, because you applied. Not everyone got to come here today. There was something you were really pursuing to be here. So it shows you're a motivated person. You have a lot of goals. You probably have a lot of passion about what you do. What will nurture you over the years so that you can continue to grow your passions, develop them, and reach your goals, and develop innovation and ingenuity? And through the yearbook, it encouraged us to take the time, take the time to smell the roses. And so in that yearbook, they featured many different types of flowers. And I was preparing my talk, I thought about a very special flower, and that's the lotus, the lotus flower. Lotus flowers tend to represent peace, tranquility, growth, beauty. They're used a lot in meditation to help people to see the beauty of something that's really, really fascinating in that they grow in murky, muddy water. As beautiful as lotus flowers are, they only grow in muddy, murky water. And so they start out underneath the water and grow, and then as they get to the surface of the water, they, tend, they start to blossom and they continue to grow towards the sunlight. 
And so in the midst of the murkiness, in the midst of challenge or what we might perceive as something that's challenging and undesirable, in the midst of that can, can grow something that's beautiful and inspiring. So can't read this. I thought it was gonna be bigger, but it's fine because probably we shouldn't be reading. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what this is about. So right now I am an assistant, it says associate, but I'm an assistant tenure track professor in the School of Nursing at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And recently I was awarded a fellowship or an award by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is our nation's largest health philanthropic organization. And so I'm a Robert Wood Johnson nurse faculty scholar. And at the bottom, at the top of this slide, it, it talks about, it's Martin Luther King's quote, which mentions the fact that injustice in healthcare is one of the, the biggest injustices of all, that everyone deserves good health, everyone deserves good healthcare. And Dr. Risa Lavizo More is current, she's a, she's a physician, an MD, and she's the head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And one of her famous quotes is that nurses will and can be the leaders in healthcare. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that because I was not always a nurse. I didn't always dream about becoming a nurse. That didn't happen until later. But I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But what that figure is, is when I became a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they really, scholar, they really implored that we needed to think about how are we going to lead? What are we going to do to make healthcare different? And how do we blend our mission as faculty scholars with our pursuits for leadership. And so when you're a professor, there are three things that are important. Science or your research, your teaching or education of others, and your, your service. So your research, teaching, and service. So we had to really get clear about what we were going to do in our research, teaching, and service that's going to make a difference for all of mankind. And in that model, the part at the bottom that I have there, I added something called self-care. You know, something is not the biggest, you know, most important thing that they look at when you're going up for tenure, but it's the thing that's going to help you get there and sustain. It's something I want to emphasize. So remember I mentioned service is one of the, the most important pieces of our work as professors. And I learned a lot about service here. I started out in Roxboro being very much involved in service, but here at NCSSM, as most of you know and experience, uh, students have to do work study. And we have to do, at least when I was here, either work study in the cafeteria or grounds. Is that still the same? Okay. That's such a wonderful thing. And so my first year, I worked in the cafeteria. So I paid a visit to the cafeteria on Wednesday when I was here too, and it looks identical to how it was <laughs> 20 years ago. I got to talk to some of the cafeteria workers, which was great. They were really fascinated that I was an alumnus visiting the cafeteria. Um, and then my other work study um, position was in the clinic. At the, you know, at the time, I was able to volunteer in the clinic and learn about, a lot about how healthcare, how it operates on that kind of level. We were also encouraged, or really required, to do community service in our community, in our home community, during the summer. And so that my summer between my junior and senior year, I went to live with my grandparents in Charlotte. My father's from Charlotte, my mother's from a very small town in Warren County, North Carolina, near Lake Gaston, but I went to stay with my grandparents in Charlotte, and I was able to work at a community health agency called the Bethlehem Center, which has been in existence since probably the 1940s or early 50s. Um, that summer, the spring before that summer, several of my classmates interviewed for a business internship, and I, I interviewed for that business internship too. Everybody got the position but me, and I didn't know why I didn't get the position, and later on I found out it was a business internship, and so during the interview they asked, what do you want to do in your future? And I said, well, I want to work in mental health. It didn't dawn on me <laughs> that they wanted us to say, I want to work in business. But luckily, during my summer at the, the Bethlehem Center, that gave me, it was an internship that I didn't realize was something that was going to prepare me for my work in the community and my research um, in health disparities. So service is connected to science and innovation because when we serve in a way that's integrated with the people that we're serving, we get to ask questions, we get exposed to research questions, we get exposed to social problems, health issues that we get to see from a different perspective than when we're reading about it in journals. And so my original uh, interest was in 
mental health. I knew I wanted to be a psychologist. So after I finished science and math, I was recruited by Julius Chambers, Honorable Ju Julius Chambers, to North Carolina Central University. The year I graduated, maybe five of us from NCSSM went to NCCU. And just like science and math, NCCU had a graduation requirement of service. And then I went straight to a PhD program in social and health psychology. And I wanted to not only solve health problems through an, a, a clinical perspective, but I really wanted to understand what are the social factors, the social historical factors that contribute to health outcomes. And the World Health Organization commissioned a study called the Social Determinants of Health. And one of the major social determinants of health is psychological stress. So we know things like income environment, education, contribute to whether a person is going to be healthy or not, or are less healthy or more healthy. But psychological stress, there's more and more research demonstrating how it influences health by two pathways. How stress influences health by our behaviors, so how we co maybe cope with stress through eating, through sedentary behavior, those kinds of things. But also how stress contributes to physiological mechanisms that can increase our risk for poor health, such as neuroendocrine processes that might increase our risk for diabetes, they high, the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary axis, that influences the way that we might develop high blood pressure, um, we might store fat around our abdomen, things like that. And so I really wanted to understand how those things function as a result of social conditions and specifically psychological stress. So my first semester in my doctorate program, it was very, very interesting. I was learning a lot about theory, but remember I had been really engaged in service in high school and college, and so I felt, started to feel a bit distant from the people that I was wanting to help. And so I thought about, well, maybe, I don't know if this social psychology is the right thing for me. And I was collecting data in a clinic. We were doing research on how stress contributes to low birth weight and preterm delivery in African-American women. And so I was a research assistant, and I got to sit in the clinic every day and interview pregnant women. And every day, what I would see is their interactions with their healthcare providers. And one of the major healthcare providers in that clinic was a nurse. A psych she was actually a nurse practitioner. And so day after day of seeing how she engaged with her patients, I went up to her and I said, who are you and what are you? I knew about nursing, but I didn't know about nurse practitioners. And she explained to me that she was a women's health nurse practitioner. And she talked about how much she loved what she did and how she loved really influencing the lives and health of her patients. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is what I want to do. And so at first I thought about quitting the PhD program because I thought, well, I found my calling. But the more and more I thought about it, the more and more I talked to my mentors, I realized that I could do both. That I could combine my interest in science and solving problems through research with my interest in helping people directly. So I was able to jointly enroll in a PhD program in social and health psychology and be a bachelor's student in nursing. They had to change the computer system so that I could be <laughs> do that, but I was able to do that. And so I finished the nursing program and then went back to my PhD studies and, you know, focusing on that primarily and worked as a nurse on the weekends and in site mental health and then in hospice care and eventually finished my doctorate and moved here. And if people hear that story, you might read it in my bio and think, wow, that's so fascinating. You did all that. But remember the lotus flower? What was my muddy part? And I see how much time I have. I'll tell you a little bit about it. Because of what I want you to know, especially the students, and I think the adults also, is that as we pursue our passions, as we think big and do things that we think will really impact society, follow our hearts, sometimes it gets overwhelming. Even, and people might say, you can't do all that. How do you do all that? And it actually did end up getting overwhelming for me. And I, that's something that I want to let people know because I think, well, Someone asked me the other day, how old are you? Because what I ended up doing is I finished my, my doctorate, then I went on to get my postdoctoral fellowship at UNC Chapel Hill. I did four years of that. And during that time is when I got my master's degree as a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So what I do is I do therapy and I run groups for people who are experiencing stress. But I think what influenced my research the most, which is understanding the cultural aspects of stress and health disparities, is the fact that as a doctoral student, I got very stressed. And I actually developed something called cluster headaches. As I was working and writing and working the, third, the second shift as a nurse and working 12-hour shifts, I got to the point where I couldn't stand light. 
Like light was just too much for me. Even as I was driving, the rear lights of the brake lights of a car in front of me, that was like someone was shining a bright light in my face. And so I had to go to the neurologist and get MRIs and ended up having to sit out of school for about a month. From all that, that work that I had done, it had built up in me. And one of the, I guess, metaphors I use and want you to think about is how as you're going forward, why it's so important to take the time is life is kind of like a bathtub that gets stopped up. What happens is it, we don't, you know, what, how, how many people have ever been in the bathtub and water starts coming to your, your, your ankles and then your legs and your, but that didn't just start that day. There are pipes, right? And there's sediments in the pipes that built up and built up and built up that we don't see unless you really take the time to know if you're in balance, if you're really giving yourself good self-care. So you don't see it unless you take the time to really experience, hey, I'm stressed, I'm overwhelmed. And so as the sediment builds, then you start to see and the water gets higher and higher. So what do we need to do to keep that sediment flowing so that the water doesn't come up to our knees, so that we don't become overwhelmed, and so that we can take all this, this brilliance that we have, all this ex exposure to mentors and educators, to science and classes, all of these things, how do we continue to be great despite things that might overwhelm us? And what I want to encourage you to do is to take the time. And remember I mentioned that the lotus flower represents peace, tranquility, it's using meditation. One of the things that I do in my research is um, study meditation and how it can contribute to stress reduction and improve health in people at highest risk. So I just completed a National Institutes of Health funded study on mindfulness for African Americans with prediabetes. And so we in included women and men in an eight week intervention and we followed them for six months after the intervention. And we looked at things like their hemoglobin A1C, cortisol, um, insulin rates, various factors that help us understand diabetes risk. And so what we're doing right now is cleaning the data so we can analyze it. But if our research is anything like previous studies on mindfulness, we'll find that the meditation helped to reduce stress and that it helped to improve um, health behaviors that decrease risk. Um, so that's just one type of thing that can be done to reduce stress. But no matter what you do, you, hopefully you'll understand the importance of taking the time. And so one pointer that I want to, to mention is how do you take the time? Do you keep it built in or do you, do you wait four months and take a, a vacation every, every, every season or once a year? Or do you build it in every day? So one example is here in science and math, we used to have something called happy half. Do y'all still have that? <laughs> so every day you can look, it was 10 to 10.30 before check, right? where you, everybody drops their work, you go find your friends, you have fun, and you do it every day. Hopefully, as you continue to grow and go move on through the years, you continue to develop and maintain some kind of happy half in your life forever. Because if you don't take the time, that order might start to build up. And hopefully, that won't happen because longevity, sustainability is the key to good work and to really impacting the world so that your puzzles can be a doorstep to ingenuity for you. Thank you so much.